All right, welcome back. This is lecture three of uh, machine learning and genomics. And uh, today we're talking about a very cool computational method and very cool biological applications. So uh, specifically, we're gonna be looking at database search and hashing, and also the probabilistic in, in, interpretation of all of these scores that we've been looking at. So basically, we're gonna distinguish global alignment, which we learned about on Tuesday from local alignment. And we're gonna look at uh, ways of doing it way, way faster using exact string matching, a probabilistic version of exact string matching. Uh, we're gonna look at a number, a numeral interpretation of long strings. And then we're gonna build up the um, toolkit that we're gonna use for the BLAST algorithm. And then if time permits, and uh, if you guys are up for uh, something greatly harder, we're going to look at uh, deterministic linear time string matching. So here's where we are. This is module two, aligning and modeling genomes. And um, uh, in this module, uh, we're going to basically learn about dynamic programming, which we did already. We're going to extend dynamic programming today and also next week. And uh, this week, we're going to learn about the difference between local and global alignment. And specifically on the, biologic, <clears throat> on the biological space, we're gonna be looking at a slightly different problem from last time. Last time we said we know that these two sequences are related, let's align them to each other to figure out the series of evolutionary events. Today we're gonna to be looking at the problem of, I have a sequence, I have no idea where it came from, let me search everything that has ever been sequenced before to find it. So the first thing we're gonna do is review uh, global alignment from Tuesday and then introduce local alignment by simply varying the boundaries and so on and so forth. How do we vary gap penalties? How do we speed up things algorithmically? And then we're gonna uh, look at how we can go from quadratic time, which was a lot better than exponential, to linear time, which is a lot better than quadratic. And then we're gonna look at the BLAST algorithm for uh, inexact matching and then the probabilistic foundations of sequence alignment, and then lastly, deterministic linear time matching. So a uh, quick recap of lecture two. We basically said that we wanted to compute the alignment between two sequences, figuring out the series of events, and we could do that recursively by basically building up the alignment score of any one pair of nucleotides, basically the prefix of S1 all the way to that nucleotide, and the prefix of S2 all the way to that nucleotide, using three subsets that we had already computed. Everybody with me so far? And then we basically put all of that information into a matrix. We use that matrix to compute the optimal score. And there was this duality between the score at that location uh, that we were storing and the uh, alignment of these two prefixes, the alignment score of those two prefixes, and also a duality between the path that I take to get to the bottom square, or to more likely get back from the bottom square in the traceback, and the specific alignment. So given that duality, I could explore an exponential number of paths using an, a, a polynomial time by simply filling up a matrix, remembering the max pointers, and then tracing back the max pointers. So I'm making a bunch of local choices, and that gives me an n squared algorithm, and then in the end, using another n squared algorithm for traceback, uh, I actually uh, reconstruct the alignment, okay? More like a 2n algorithm. So the key was that we were only using local update rules, <coughs> just like in the Fibonacci example, uh, to basically compute uh, the maximum alignment score of the prefix all the way to i and the prefix all the way to j, using the maximum of three options. The first is to uh, extend both sequences by one and then base it on that score plus whatever score I get from extension, or base it on that score uh, plus the gap penalty, or that score plus the gap penalty, okay? And we were computing these scores for prefixes of increasing length, and then when we reach bottom right, we could then trace back to get the optimal solution. We saw how we can define these five um, goals, if you wish, these five steps to building a dynamic programming solution, namely finding the right parameterization. And in this particular case, it was this IJ prefix parameterization, making sure that the sub problem is finite, there's only n squared 
possible uh, sub-alignment scores. Um, there, the traversal order was important. Basically, make sure that the computation is always available, the, the results are always available when you need them. And then the recursion formula. How do we compute the larger problem as a function of the subparts? And then lastly, every single time I did one of these max operations, I was storing where the max came from to be able to do the traceback. We saw two variations that allowed us to do things either uh, more efficiently in time or more efficiently in space. The first was bounded alignment that was only looking at a um, window of length k surrounding the diagonal, and therefore it became a kn algorithm rather than uh, n squared algorithm. And the second one was linear space computation, basically only remembering the last column each time when constructing the new column, and as a new one is constructed, throwing away the one right before that. And the reason is that I only need three entries every single time, and therefore if I remember the current column all the way to where I am and the previous column, I have all these three entries available. Raise your hands if you're 100% with me on all of that. Great. So then there was this uh, very cool thing that I covered in the last uh, few milliseconds of the class, which is that you could certainly get the score here, but to get the actual path, you needed n square space to store all the pointers. Unless you did something very cool, which was to compute this matrix from the forward and from the right side, add up these two scores as the best score that I can get getting all the way to there, and the best score getting all the way back from there, add up those two, and then figure out the maximum, and that gives me the crossing point each time. And that crossing point allows me to break up this matrix into progressively smaller matrices, and each time I can have a linear memory where I store where was that cross point, and then on that linear memory, I can just remember each of these midpoints, and then eventually construct the entire alignment from that. Who's with me on the, this part here? Raise your hands if you are. Who's not with me on this part? Okay, great. So again, this is more advanced. You don't need to get it, uh, but you can ask in your station. My office hours will be tomorrow at 2 p.m., so um, I will announce that by email as well, but it seems to be uh, the best time. It's recitations at 3 o'clock, right? Tomorrow, 2.30 to 3. Oh, no, recitation. Tomorrow is 3 to 4 recitation. So an hour before recitation, I will hold my office hours. Okay? I currently have a trip for San Francisco, so uh, it may not happen, but my, my guess is that I will not be getting on that flight. So, um, but anyway, I will send an <laughs> announcement uh, letting you know. And if I do get on that flight, I will be uh, calling it remotely by video. We'll figure it out. All right, so then the last part uh, is that we could actually do all that uh, super, super explicitly. And this is a great learning tool to basically see how changing any of these parameters changes any of these scores, how changing any of these letters changes the path, and so on and so forth. So basically, this is genome alignment in spreadsheet, where we could basically compute the pairwise scores of individual nucleotides, the sum of the scores as I go down the matrix, the uh, maximum choices by comparing this with the actual scores, and then the traceback by basically asking for every position, you know, was I uh, pointed to by my neighbor, okay? And that basically led us to not only the path, but also counting the number of possible paths. And here you can see five, because there are five paths that lead all the way to here because of this bifurcation event where multiple entries were leading to the maximum. By playing with the parameters, you can basically change the sequence to be, um, you know, to have two possible paths. And here's one example where TAAG, for example, appears twice. So I can align it either on the left or I can align it on the right, and both give me the same score. And this is, um, you know, just one way to, to realize what's, what's actually happening with alignment. But this is also great motivation for local alignment. You might realize that, hey, this is a duplicated region. Maybe I should be doing global alignment. Maybe I should be doing local alignment. And here's all the code for uh, doing all these parts. Okay? So the goal for today is uh, what is actually local alignment. So here's the statement of the problem. <clears throat> Instead of aligning the entire sequence S globally to the entire sequence T, 
I'm only going to be aligning a subset of S to a subset of T. And that's a local alignment. So local alignment of strings S and T is an alignment of a substring of S with a substring of T. Why do I care about local alignments? Because I may be just looking at a small domain of a gene that only has conserved portions. This part of the gene is completely different. This part of the gene is completely different. But that domain is conserved. So I may only want to care that, about that. Or if S and T are two chromosomes, I may only care about a portion of a gene that is conserved between these two chromosomes. I don't care to align all of the rest. Or uh, I may have a very large segment that has undergone rearrangements, and I want to figure out what are the different parts rather than the whole segment. So global alignment basically always starts at the top left and always ends at the bottom right. Local alignment could simply say, well, you know, this part here best aligns to that part there, and this part here best aligns there, and this part here there, and this part here there. Is everybody with me? So if I were to label these segments, A, B, C, D on the top, then the order on the left is basically B, D, A, C. Sounds good? So basically A, B, C, D becomes B, D, A, C. And that's perfectly fine by evolution. You know, sometimes rearrangements happen. And if, I, if I'm trying to construct a global alignment here, I can only get B and C, or B and D, or A and C, but I cannot ever get all four segments. So one of the motivations for this local alignment approach is that I can actually recover all of the different parts that, are, that align rather than just only one path from the top left to the bottom right. Raise your hands if you're with me. Great. So how do I change my algorithm from global alignment to local alignment? Okay. So the needleman gunsch algorithm basically says I'm going to initialize things with uh, zero, 00 at the top left. I'm going to terminate at the bottom right. And then my update rule is going to be one of three choices, above, to the left, or up left. Okay. Can I use that to now construct the smith waterman algorithm? What do I need to change? Raise your hands if you have the answer. Got one answer. I want to see a few more. Two, three, four, go for it. Yep. So where would I be able to terminate? Okay, someone else? Whenever, whenever it hits zero, I could terminate. Yeah. Great. And back there, green. Good. Good. So basically, there's no point in starting from something negative and moving up. I should always be able to choose zero in any one of those locations. So. And in terms of the initialization, I'm going to change anything? Um, two answers. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Perfect. Right? Yep. Okay. You guys got it. So basically, I initialize anywhere on the top or on the left. I can choose to just restart anywhere. And I can terminate anywhere. Okay, you guys are pros at this. Um, all right, so here's some more variations on uh, uh, the theme. So basically we now can use semi-global alignment. So basically global is this, local is that. <laughs> semi-global basically means, well, I may just have fragments of my sequence. I still wanna you know, align everything, but only up until my sequence ends. So, this basically says, I still want a global alignment, but in my sequencing run, I may have just run out of reads. I don't want to penalize with end gaps for anything that's trailing. So how can I do this? Raise your hands. One answer. Two, go for it. Yeah, so uh, you keep initializing until you reach a point where uh, you have a non-zero path okay good so what do i need to change practically what do i do for the initialization 
zero at the top and on the left. And what about the termination? Anywhere on the bottom or on the right, okay? So top row, left column, bottom row, right column, and then I don't have the zero anymore, okay? All right, so that's local alignment or semi-global alignment. Uh, we can also uh, look at the gap penalty that we uh, saw earlier. So basically before, we had every gap count exactly the same. But I could also say, well, um, I just want to have some scoring function based on the length of the gap. So some function gamma that basically tells me what is the penalty for a gap of length three or a gap of length four. So basically I minus K or J minus K is the penalty that I get for that gap. So to do this, I actually need to at every point look at not just three neighboring entries, but all neighboring entries in that column or in that row that precede me. And that's suddenly not an N squared algorithm anymore because I have to do N squared computations and for each of those computations, I have to look at n plus m entries. So it's a cubic algorithm suddenly. So it's much, much lower. Is everybody with me on that? So, but we don't have to be so general. We could simply say, let me build a quadratic function, or let me build an affine function, or let me build a mod 3 function, and so on and so forth. So I could vary the type of penalty this gamma function of what is the gap penalty of a gap of length n could simply be linear. Every additional character that I include as a gap costs exactly the same, okay? And that basically is what we already did. The quadratic gap basically says that I will pay a penalty for starting a gap and then maybe a you know, diminishing return or a diminishing cost as I go through greater and greater gaps. But that's very expensive. That's require, that requires a cubic algorithm. But I could basically say I have a penalty for opening a gap and then a linear penalty thereafter. And this is doable by adding a second matrix for remembering if I'm already in the gap. Okay, And we talked about that in a lecture on uh, Tuesday. And you can also see it in registration. Okay? I could also build a, a gap that basically says, I will penalize more um, gaps that are not a multiple of three. And that could be very helpful within protein coding regions, for example. So gaps of length three divisible by three are penalized less because they conserve the reading frame. And this is feasible, but it requires simply more states. So the possible states are, I'm starting, or uh, mod three minus one, mod three minus two, yeah, or, or sorry, the mod three is one, the mod three is two, the mod three is zero which basically keeps shifting between different matrices to just remember the state of whether I have modulo one, modulo three of zero or, or one or two. Okay, who's with me so far? Great. All right, so this is basically realizing that now that we have abstracted away this extremely complicated recursion of looking for smaller gap lengths and sorry, looking for smaller alignment pairs, and then penalizing the gaps, penalizing the mismatches, and so on and so forth. All of that has been abstracted away into these matrices. And now we've been able to do all these complicated modifications by simply changing that framework that we have established, which is very, very powerful. So we, we basically saw how we can go from global to local alignment using just slight modifications, how we can vary the gap penalty, and how we can uh, achieve these algorithm speed up, so only looking at a radius or not uh, storing everything and so on and so forth, okay? Now we're gonna shift gears completely. Now we're gonna basically look at a completely different paradigm for doing alignments. And this is gonna be allowing us to go beyond the quadratic time to a linear time alignment, okay? So we're gonna look at the carp rabin algorithm and how we can actually interpret these uh, alignments numerically, okay? So then the idea is when looking for exact matches of a pattern, i.e. no gaps, and the carp rabin algorithm interprets these strings partly numerically, and we're going to start with the broken version of the algorithm and then progressively fix it to make it work. And um, we're going to look at uh, the probabilistic solution, which 
is expected to run in linear time, but in some cases could be slower. And then if time permits, we're gonna look at a deterministic uh, linear time solution, um, which um, um, is a little more complicated, okay? And there's various versions of that. Um, all right, so here's the deal. Let's start interpreting these things numerically. Instead of zeros and ones, let's look at numbers between zero and nine. So I'm gonna try to search for the pattern three, one, four, one, five. I don't know if this was Greek, I would call it pattern pi. Uh, and then I'm searching for P uh, inside this string, okay? How can I do that really fast? Raise your hand. So what's the first thing I would do? First thing I would do is that I would read T and at every starting position, I would replace that digit with a number. What number would I put here? 23,590. What number would I put there? 35,902. What number would I put there? 59,023. Okay, is everybody with me? So in the first pass, I just go through and I compute that number. And on the second pass, I just simply compare that number to that number, okay? Who thinks this is kind of cool? Yay. So basically, I went from a quadratic algorithm to a linear algorithm, right? Now all I need to do is do one comparison for every position, okay? Why is this broken? This does not actually work. Why? One answer, two answers, three answers, four, Right. Go ahead. First problem is how how long is my string? Remember, I said I want to you know maybe search for a string of length a thousand in a genome of length three billion. Okay, so I have a gene of length a thousand. So how fast can I compare two digits of length five? I mean, two numbers uh, with five digits. Super fast, right? because they fit into my 32-bit machine. Remember how I told you that this uh, 42 as the sum of three cubes was finally solved? I put those into Excel. Excel just did not get the right answer. It didn't get 42. And the reason is that the last two decimal points just ignored. It just didn't have enough memory into its um, processor to basically allow for numbers this big. And that was only like 12, you know, decimal, I mean 12 uh, digits. With numbers of a thousand digits, I either need a humongous machine or I need to encode it in many, many bits or bytes in my machine, okay? And the many bytes in my machine are no longer gonna be constant time, okay? So the first thing that we need to do, oh, first of all, here's how I would do it, da, 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 da. and then sort of if they match, uh, then that basically means that this pattern matches the text, so I can return the right answer, okay? So the simple algorithm that does not work is we're gonna first compute x, uh, which is this number, and then for every place, I'm gonna compute y, and then if the two are equal, I'm gonna basically report a match, okay? The first problem is that doing this comparison is extremely expensive for very, very long patterns, okay? Who's with me on this? Great. All right, so um, the second problem is that, um, the, so there was a, a few hands up, so you had your hand up as well. So what's another problem? Why doesn't this work? That's interesting. So you're saying that I want to count the number of these matches rather than simply say, is there a perfect match, right? Uh, so if I want to do inexact matching, then this doesn't help me at all. That's, that's a very good insight. It basically, so, you know, so the, the, first, the first objection is, what, you know, if you're looking at evolutionary time, you just might not care to find only perfectly exact matches. You might actually want to know what is the digit by digit comparison. But for now, let's assume that we're just looking for exact matches. 
and then we're going to look for inexact matches. So that's part one. Was there another aspect of your comment? Yeah, but I'm not going to take the difference between these two numbers. I'm not going to say are they close enough. But you're absolutely right. So basically, the, the second thing is if I was looking for inexact matching, then looking at the difference between them would not be good because I'm looking for um, basically because it would be overweighing the first decimal point. But again, I'm looking for exact matches. Then we're going to look at inexact matches. There were a few other hands. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. What, another another objection. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times these successive bars are based on each other and Yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. So basically, every compute Y <laughs> requires a bunch of operations to basically just replace this with 23,590. Yeah, of course, I can read it off the slide. But a machine has to say, well, take this, multiply by 10,000, plus this <laughs> multiplied by 1,000, plus this multiplied by 100, plus this multiplied by 10, plus this, right? That's a linear computation. It's not just that as the numbers get longer, it's really an n times m algorithm in order to compute one from the other. But you actually have an insight that says, wow, we can fix that. Sorry, you had one more comment? Um, in one sense, like, you are giving the technology. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So I think that's also his comment. Any other comments? All right, so basically, the first thing is we need to fix how long this takes. The second one is we need to, to sort of somehow reuse our computation. <laughs> uh, hi, Jackie, we're having a class. <laughs> All right, well. Um, I should use a different line when doing the lecture. <laughs> this is uh, my open office policy where anybody can come into my Zoom line at any time. Um, and this is my mom calling, so my mom hasn't called yet. It will happen before the end of the term, I promise. She's Greek, so I always take the call, otherwise the cops will come rushing in before the end of the lecture. <laughs> All right, so um, let's now uh, fix it. So basically the first is to compute Y, it took us a linear time. So let's instead compute y using y i minus 1. Okay? So if I've already computed 23,590, how can I use that to compute 35,902? We have one answer here. Two, three, four. Uh, let's go back there. Okay. Perfect. Good, good. So basically, I have to subtract, you know, the first digit, and I can do that using mod, for example, and then um, add the last digit and multiply by 10. Perfect. So basically, what we're going to do is um, first remove the old high order bit then left shift and add the new low order bit okay sounds good so the middle digits of the number are already computed so we just need to shift them to the left and then remove the higher order bit and add the low order bit okay this is a comp and suddenly that's a constant time computation okay so that's the first fix the second fix is that these numbers are very, very big. So one way to do that is to actually make the numbers smaller. How do I do that? By taking the mod. So I'm going to mod some big prime number. Okay, That's a constant time computation. But it allows my numbers to stay small. So instead of you know, 1,000 digits, maybe there'll be 32 digits or something. Okay, So if I hash mod p, I'm keeping the number small. Is everybody with me on how this happens? So basically, I'm taking a very, very large space of every two to the thousand long possible number, 
And now I'm making this only two to the 32. That's a dramatic reduction. But there's only so many possibilities of what the genome might look like. So basically, most of these two to the thousand uh, you know, bins are empty. So why bother with those two to the thousand bins? If I make it two to the 32 bins, I still have a vastly empty space. But what's the problem? Every now and then, when I collapse these two to the thousand into two to the 32, I will get collisions, clashes. I will have two numbers that were distinct in that space that now map to the exact same bucket. Okay? Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. Perfect. So um, we now have to deal with spurious hits due to hashing. Okay? And the way to do that is to basically say, well, if that number is exactly identical to that number, then I will do an additional test. And that additional test will be, let's now compute the uh, you know, similarity at every position and then say, yes, there's a match. Otherwise, that was a spurious hit and we continue. Okay? So we basically took an algorithm in black that doesn't work and then we added the red, the green, and the blue and we made it work. Okay? Uh, so the first part was computing the next one, the, the next digit uh, here, sorry, the next number by reusing the digits of the previous number. The next one was making the numbers relatively small so that they're not a thousand bits long. And then the, the last one is dealing with collisions. Okay? So we saw the uh, first one in detail. Let's now lo look at the second part in detail. How do we deal with, yeah? Do you have to unmatch the numbers before you perform the static operation to get the next number in the reading frame? Uh, interestingly, no, because all of that is hash um, invariant. Oh, okay. But that's a, that, that's a very good question. Yeah. So the, basically the second part of dealing with long numbers in constant time was um, to get the order of n time. We need to compute perform the operations in order one time, but if the arguments are very, very long, this can take order m time, or two to the m long numbers, and we need to reduce the number range to something more manageable. The solution was to map these large universe of keys from you know, two to the m into two to something much smaller, okay? And there's many hash functions that are possible, and then these have both theoretical and practical properties. The first thing we want is that if I compute the hash of x, and x is equal to y, and I compute that hash again, I get the same hash. Okay. Um, some people forget that, so they're like, ooh, I'm just going to pick a random number and make it smaller. No, you have to pick exactly the same number each time. So the first is just make sure that two numbers from far, far away that are actually identical map to the same thing. Uh, and then the second one is much more complicated, which is that if two numbers are actually distinct in that much larger space, then the probability that they match, that they fall into the same bin is one over the number of bins. In other words, that any number in that humongous space has an equal probability in falling in any of my n bins. Okay? So that's sort of something that's very desirable for these hash functions. And it's very hard to guarantee this theoretically uh, and yet have an easily computed function. But mod, for example, is an, uh, something that, given some distribution of the input, will give you that guarantee. But given any distributed, uh, any input distribution, you may have a harder time doing that. Okay? So again, taking the mod with some unique number allows you to, to do that. But then the new problem that we face there is collisions. And now to deal with collisions, we basically, uh, you know, have to verify that every hit, which means that the hash matches, corresponds to a valid match, which means that the original numbers match. Okay? So we need to recompute uh, the equality for the entire string, not just the hash, and to avoid the worst type behavior of many collisions with some bad M. So if I choose a very bad M, then I will have a lot of collisions uh, because many of these numbers will fall to the same bucket. In the worst case, all of these numbers fall to the same bucket. And then I will have to do the computation of the entire string every single time. And then that becomes an order and, and algorithm, so it's a quadratic algorithm. Okay? So basically, the, the thing now with choosing a random m is that depending on that m, I have some probability of collision, 
and that probability will assume is one over m. And then we will only be able to compute an expected runtime rather than a worst case runtime. Okay? And the expected runtime run will be uh, including the cost of verification. Basically, every single time I have to do the, you know, letter by letter comparison, I have to <coughs> uh, spend an order M computation for every N entry. And then in the worst case, this could be order MN. But in the average case, or in the expected case, this ends up being order N, <laughs> which is linear. So we basically know, we need to show that the probability of the spurious kit is small. And based on that probability, the expected runtime is simply you know, computing this M long operation only for that probability, basically for the fraction that will actually have a collision. Okay? So that's the combined algorithm. You basically have, you first compute M, X mod P, and then for every location you compute YI mod P using YI minus one. And then if there's a match, if there's a hit, you want to sort of check that there's a match. Sounds good? So this was basically linear time, uh, you know, probabilistic linear time, expected linear time, exact string matching, okay? So exact basically means that, yes, if there's a mismatch, it doesn't matter if I'm off by one, I'm just simply going to say, no, there's no match here, okay? So now we're going to basically look at how we can deal with inexact string matching. In other words, if my characters are off by one, if my, you know, my two strings are off by one, I'd still be able, to be able to find a match. And this numeric interpretation does not allow me to do that. So how, what can I do? So basically what we're gonna do is look at hashing with some neighborhood search. So instead of just saying, I'm only gonna look at this string and compute it numerically, I'm gonna look at this string and maybe all of the strings are off by one and then compute all of those numerically and then hash all of those into my database, okay? So I'm gonna build on my exact string matching to basically build my inexact string matching by searching the neighborhood, okay? So the other approach is that instead of just looking at my entire string, maybe I'm gonna chop up my string and I'm gonna look for exact matches of substrings of my string, okay? So I can do that with either contiguous sub uh, strings or with non-contiguous substrings known as poems. So I could basically say, I'm only gonna you know, search for matches of these exact subset of eight characters out of 12 characters by leaving a gap each time. And that will now be my new hash that I'm gonna search for exactly, okay? So one way of doing inexact string matching is to basically search for subsets of my string or for searching that neighborhood, okay? And we're gonna look at all of that in detail. So everybody with me so far? Great. So again, the sequence alignment problem assumed that the sequences have some common ancestry and finding the right alignment between two sequences that capture those evolutionary events was our goal. And there was an evolutionary interpretation in terms of the minimum number of events or the minimum cost of these uh, mutation, substitution, um, uh, deletion and insertion operations, okay? The sequence database search problem is very different. Here, we just want to give a query, some new sequence, and a target, which is many, many old sequences. We want to ask which sequences, if any, of my database are possibly related to the query without worrying about the exact number of events. I just want to do this really, really fast. And the individual alignments, they don't need to be perfect. Once the initial matches are reported, we can then fine tune them later. We can actually just run the quadratic algorithm for the small number of matches that we get, okay? So the query must be very fast for a new sequence and most sequences will be completely unrelated to the query. So we can exploit that aspect of the problem to basically say, well, I don't wanna align every one of them really well. And I know that most of their sequence, you know, these sequences will be matching. Maybe they'll have two or three mismatches. How can I do that really, really fast? fast, so we can exploit the distinct nature of this database search problem to speed up the search uh, dramatically. So uh, the key idea is the following. If you're gonna reject any match that's not at least 90% identical, then why even bother looking at sequences 
that don't have a stretch of 10 identical nucleotides in a row. Let me explain. I only have 10 mismatches to put into my sequence, and I have a sequence of length 100. Even if I distribute them in the worst possible way, which is one every 10 nucleotides, I'm going to run out of mismatches before I can disrupt every single stretch of 10 identical nucleotides. Okay? So basically, there's, um, you know, there's almost a guarantee that I'm going to have at least some part of my sequence which will be perfectly conserved. Okay? Now, that's in the worst possible theoretical case. In practice, it's actually even better for me. Why? Because I'm looking for identical stretches. And in practice, even if the process was completely random, I would find identical stretches very often, just by chance. But the process is actually non-random because biology preserves some stretches that are important and doesn't care about other stretches that are unimportant. So if I'm basically searching for consecutive stretches of perfect identity, I'm actually by chance much more likely than in the worst case to find them. And in practice, because of the biological properties, even more likely to find them than by chance, which is already much better than the worst case. Who's with me on this? Raise your hands. Awesome, great. So basically, uh, the worst case is this pigeonhole principle of basically, I only have so many mismatches to distribute, and some of these mismatches by chance will be falling in the same bin, but even in the worst case, these mismatches will have to be laid out in such a way that I still have perfect stretches of identity, but in, uh, in general, it's even, even better than that, okay? So, <clears throat> um, yeah. This is just an example. Okay. And basically, depending on this threshold, I will tune the algorithm to be faster or slower. Most of the time, I'll be looking, I mean, depending on the problem, I'll, I'll be sort of tuning that threshold different. So, one of the things that we do very, very commonly is we use sequencing to measure molecular events in a cell to measure the number of times that a regulator is bound, or to measure the number of times that an mRNA molecule is uh, produced from a piece of DNA. In those cases, I'm always matching back to the human genome for almost perfect matches, except for the occasional sequencing error. So for those cases, I'm actually gonna be looking at 99% identity. And then I can basically look for very large stretches of perfect identity and go super, super blazingly fast. In other cases, I'm going to be looking for matches between human and chimp. And there, 99% identity is actually the right thing to look for. If I'm looking for matches in another human, 99.9% .9 identity is the right thing to look for. If I'm looking at matches in mouse, maybe it's 60% and so, and so forth. So depending on that threshold, I can basically tune the length of perfect matches that I'm going to be looking for. Any other questions? Um, okay, so basically, <clears throat> the solution for all that, uh, and, and, and then the last thing is uh, we want to put the speed where we need it, and i.e., we can use the, our sweet time during pre processing to process the database, but because that's all offline. And now I'm ready, someone comes in with a query, I've organized my database in a way that will make it super, super fast. So once the query arrives, I can you know, respond right away. Okay? So that's always very important in algorithmic thinking. Basically, you want to you want to sort of say which part does, needs to be to be fast. Yes, you know, this is an n squared algorithm, but if I can do n squared prep time, so that when the query comes, I have linear uh, time, the user experience will be, you know, equally uh, good to if I had a linear time algorithm to start with. Okay, so I can basically partition the time to pre-processing versus lifetime, and then put, put the speed where I need it, okay? All right, so then the solution to all of that is content-based indexing and BLAST. So basically, for example, if I index every tenmer, only one tenmer in four to the 10 will match, and that's one in a million. Even with 500 kmers, it's only one in 2,000. 
So this is a dramatic speed up from having to search everything in the database, okay? And many additional speed ups are possible as we're gonna see. So that's what led to basically this uh, very um, modestly named basic local alignment search tool or, or, or BLAST, but this very, very cool acronym. So um, I don't know how many citations you got for your most highly cited paper, but uh, you know, a few thousand is, you're doing pretty awesome. Uh, tens of thousands, I mean, that, that's like a whole other level. So um, if you write a, a tool in 1990 that basically has 55,000 citations, you should probably rest. And these guys basically said, oh, let's now do gap blast. And they wrote another paper <laughs> that got even more citations. So uh, actually almost as many citations. So this is, this is pretty amazing. Like, uh, you know, these, these guys uh, just really uh, uh, did something very, very good that is amazingly useful. And it totally transformed the field. And that's why I have ten, they have tens of thousands of citations. They basically, you know, this is like, you know, 20 years later, they're still, you know, extremely highly cited because people are using Blast all the time. You know, it used to be that you had to do Smith-Waterman, which is already quadratic instead of exponential, to basically search a match in a database. And suddenly you could do it in milliseconds. Like you just launch a query, boom, you know, something comes back. So... Uh, you know, this is hugely, hugely fast. So basically the two insights are basically number one, hashing, and that's just like carp Rabin. So basically semi-numerical string matching. And the second one is this neighborhood search. So we can find hits even when there's no exact uh, K-mer matches, okay? So here's how the algorithm works. We basically first receive a query, and that's, for example, you know, PQG. Okay, that's, that's in amino acid space. That's the query that we're looking for, okay? So we basically have a very long query, and now we're gonna split the query into these words, and we're gonna search each of these words into our database, okay? For nucleotides, this could be 10 mers. For amino acids, because it's not two to the four, it, it's not, um, you know, four to the N, which is the number of nucleotides, uh, nucleotide options to the length, it's like 20 to the end, then the number of possibilities is much, much higher, and therefore the word is actually much, much smaller to basically get the same speed up. So 20 to the third is you know, uh, very, uh, very big. So we're gonna split the query into overlapping words of length W, okay? So basically I go every three nucleotides, and sorry, every one nucleotide, and I take a length of three nucleotides, and I split my query that way. And then I'm gonna basically hash each of these into my database. But I'm not just gonna, just gonna hash the exact strings that I got, I'm gonna hash more of them. I'm basically gonna look at a neighborhood of words. Why do I do that? In order to capture inexact matches, okay? So uh, if I know the amino acid similarity scores of PQG to you know, every other triplet, I'm just gonna go down my list of triplets until some threshold T, and this is how big the neighborhood will be. So I could go super, super low here, but then I have a lot of spurious matches, spurious hits. So instead, by keeping this stringent, well, if I don't find a hit here, maybe I'll find a hit there, or maybe I'll find a hit here. So I don't have to worry about every single uh, window giving me a hit, I can just count on the fact that I have many, many windows, any one of which has the opportunity of giving me a hit in my database, okay? So that's the first step. So basically I split the query into, into overlapping words, and then the second step is to search a neighborhood of these words, going down the list of amino acid similarities, and then that's the semi-numerical uh, interpretation where basically, based on this, I immediately look into my WMR database, where is that corresponding entry? And this could just be alphanumerical. Basically, for A, 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 I look at the top, and for T, 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 I look at the bottom. And for every number in between, I can compute immediately where will that be in the database. And then I can do basically here, have a list of all of the places in my database that match this triplet, okay? 
So the first thing that I do before I even start this is that I parse my entire database. I look at every consecutive tamer, and then I put all those tamers in the corresponding list by basically saying, well, this is the place where all of these uh, sequences match PMG. Okay, so when I search for PMG, I'm just gonna go into the PMG here and I'm gonna enter those. How did I get those? By basically scanning my database once and then putting all of the positions where each of the words occurs in a long list cached by uh, that word. Who's 100% with me so far? Raise your hands. Okay, who's not following 100%? Okay, any questions? So now's a good time to take questions. Yes. This is something that we're going to talk about more in the last part of this lecture, which is the score. It's basically how likely is it that this is a real match. So the score basically gives you one over the probability of this match being there spuriously. So, you know, the, this is minus log 10 of some score and uh, of some probability. And basically, the higher that number, the more likely it is to come from a truly evolutionarily related pair of amino acids. Uh, that doesn't happen. That's exactly right. So basically, I'm starting from here. I already know this from evolution. I have some scoring matrix that basically tells me how similar is A with A, A with T, A with C, A with G in the, in the nucleotide space. And then same thing in the amino acid space. I basically have a matrix of similarity of all pairs of amino acids. And based on that matrix of pairwise similarity scores, I can compute the triplet score, which is simply the sum of the three counts. So then I can go down the list of amino acid substitutions that are the most favorable, that are the most likely to have happened by evolution, and that's what gives me that score. Thanks, that's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. So the W, the w word database is that? When you're referring to that, are you referring to one subject in the database, or is that, is that every uh, uh, in your sequence database, or is that? So that's actually across all sequences that have ever been sequenced. So is it that you kind of iterate through your query, and for each of those words, yes, you like narrow down all the uh, uh, the subjects in the database. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, as soon as I have a query, yeah. this basically says. Here's all the places in the human genome and in the mouse genome and in the rat genome and in the you know worm genome that have that match. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Other questions? Yeah. I guess it's how do you, uh, maybe I miss it. How do you generate the yield of the So I can pre-compute that, or I can basically say if I know that my threshold is 13 for P, which is one amino acid. I can basically say what are all of the amino acids that have less than a, a penalty of five for switching them. And then I can just pre-compute that. I can basically say, well, for this position, you know, here, basically if I switch the first position, I'm gonna lose a lot. So, you know, maybe that's why there's only P's. In the second position, you know, uh, this can be easily replaced. And in the third position, oh, I'm again gonna pay a big penalty. So this simply comes straight from the amino acid similarity matrix scores. And then at the single amino acid level, I have these scores. And at the triplet level, I can have, um, you know, similarly just the sum of these scores. Does that answer your question? So basically, I can do an exhaustive search over all amino acid substitutions that still are above that threshold, and then just rank them by score. And then I can sort of pre-compute these neighborhood lists. Does that answer you? Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did not explain step four yet. So I will explain it afterwards. Yeah. OK, yeah. Uh, so it's a parameter. I can make it longer, and I will have fewer hits, but I might miss some true matches. I can make it shorter. I will have more hits, but I will not be as fast because most of these hits will not be real matches. So that parameter of W really depends on the application. Am I searching to any distant species or only very close relatives? Any other questions? These are all great questions. OK, yes. Yeah. 
they basically say, how similar is this to that? And I will explain this course much more in the last section of the lecture, not the lecture, when we talk about the probabilistic interpretation of penalties. But basically, this is exactly the match mismatch matrix that we looked at earlier for nucleotides, but now for amino acids. Basically, for, for nucleotides, it basically says, well, the purin purin cost me 0.5, and the purin pyrimidin cost me 2.5. That's basically simply the penalty that I paid. And the score basically tells me how much of a penalty have I found, have I paid. PQG to PQG has a maximum score of 18. That's a penalty of five going down to here. So that basically tells me how much did this change and how unlikely is it to be truly evolutionarily related. And that score diminishes the further I go in evolutionary space. Any other questions? These are all fantastic questions. Okay. Now who's with me? Raise your hands. Awesome, yay, every hand's up. All right, so basically, I split my query into overlapping words, I find the neighborhood words all the way to threshold T, and then I look up in the table where those occur, and those give me my seeds. Now that I have my seeds, I want to basically say, can I turn a seed into a match? And that's step four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extend the seed without any gaps, just walking out to the right and to the left, and then seeing if stuff nearby also matches. And that gives me a total score for that segment, okay? And if that score is high enough, that becomes a high scoring segment pair, okay? And then after I have these high scoring segment pairs, I can just extend them into a full alignment using my dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, so then I can allow gaps. Yeah? Uh, this is exactly the same score. So I could just recompute it, or I could just simply say, ooh, I've already computed those three, let me compute the other one. But it's exactly the same score. It's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, very cool. So, and then after I'm done, I can report both the significance and the actual alignment of each match. So the significance I get based on the distribution of scores in my database, I can basically say, wow, this is really unlikely to get such a high score. So that's extremely important because it basically says how, you know, what's the probability that this is truly a, 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 a evolutionary related sequence pair. Sounds good? So I can go beyond WMR indexing. So basically I wanna be both faster and more sensitive. And one way to do that is to uh, do two hit blasts. So basically two smaller WMRs are much more likely than one longer one. So two hit blast was a big hit. Sorry, no pun intended. Um, and it basically proved to be much more useful in practice. Why? Because you know, having one domain and another domain that are spaced apart was evolutionarily much more likely, but randomly much less likely. So it ended up being a more sensitive searching method, uh, and it improved sensitivity at any speed, and it proved speed at any sensitivity. So it was just strictly uh, better. And beyond WMERS, I could also hash with non-consecutive gamers. So, for example, if I know that. Um, you know, uh, stretches of perfect similarity are very rare for this evolutionary distance. Well, I could basically say I only care about the first, the third, and the fourth position out of five, or the first, second, and fifth position. Okay? And then I can just compute my database based on a, a comb, like one, two, five, and I can scan that comb through my database and hash only the first, second, and fifth position. And then when I have my query, same first, second, and fifth. And that gives me matches. And the advantage of that is that I don't, I'm not constrained anymore to have contiguous segments. And I can go to much further evolutionary distances. Okay? And the last thing is promiscuous regions. So if I have stretches of G, 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 this happens a lot in the genome. So if I have G, 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 I could basically say, okay, great. Let me look at all the places we have G, 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 G. 
But if that happens millions of times, I now have millions of spurious hits. How much information do they give me? Well, every one of them, very, very little, because that sequence is very common, very repetitive. So there's many ways of doing this. One way of, of, of throwing those out, one way is to basically say, well, I know some things that are very common in the genome and that are very repetitive and therefore could be hits for non-evolutionary related misregions. They could just be similar, but not necessarily evolutionary related. So I'm gonna really hard study where are those occurring from and then specifically throw away these regions. The other way is to build my database. And if I have too many hits in my database for one of these entries, so I'm, I'm sort of starting to build my dictionary, and this, this entry has 2,000 hits, this entry has 1,000 1, hits, this one has 4,000, and this one has 100,000. I can just throw that one away. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry what caused it. I can just simply say, well, if this one has 100 million places in the genome, it's promiscuous. I don't, I don't even want to see it. So I can just simply throw away the ones that just cause too many matches. And every single time I find them, if I've filled out the length of my database, next time I want to add something there, I'm like, oh, I don't want to add this, just throw it away, right? So one way of filtering promiscuous regions is to just look at the database, filter out low complexity in your query, or simply filter the most overrepresented items in your database. Because by definition, they're the least informative ones. If they happen very often, the probability that they happen due to relatedness is effectively diluted out by all of those spurious occurrences of that. Is everybody with me here? And that ties into this whole probabilistic interpretation. So, we basically saw local alignment from global alignment by simply changing the parameters. And then we saw how we can do linear time alignment by hashing, by basically doing this numerical interpretation. And then we saw the BLAST algorithm that's based on that, but it allows this neighborhood search that goes beyond just exact matching to inexact matching. And now we're going to look at the probabilistic foundations. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, because uh, there are instances where we have possibly like large regions, we have uh, instability at the ends of the region. And right now, sort of the state of you know, the state of the art is to locally align on those regions. Uh, but is there a way to outfit the database such that you can account for, for example, like satellite instability? Yeah, it's a great question. Why don't we talk about it after, after class? Any other questions? Okay. Everybody with me so far? Great. So now let's see where are those mismatch penalties coming from? A lot of people ask, well, where, what does 13 actually mean? What does 18 actually mean? And even earlier, when we we're talking about these, you know, ACGT pairs, um, you know, where are those cores coming from? So, uh, you know, this is this part here. Where does that come from? So um, they come from this matrix of similarities. It basically says, what is the penalty that I get for matching A to A, G, T, or C? What is either the reward or the penalty, okay? And that's an arbitrary matrix that we came up with when aligning nucleotides. And that's an extremely carefully studied matrix that was built for aligning amino acids. There's two such matrices. One is called BLOSOM, and the other one's called PAM. So uh, BLOSOM stands for uh, sum in blocks. And um, this basically gives me the score that I should be rewarding myself or penalizing myself for aligning this amino acid to that amino acid. Okay? So let's study this matrix. Um, why are some region, why are some numbers here much bigger on the diagonal? So basically um, here, uh, to match a tryptophan to a tryptophan, I get a reward of 11. And then uh, leucine complains like, hey, when I match another leucine, you only give me four. Why do you give tryptophan 11? So why? One answer. Two answers, three answers, four. Uh, let's go with uh, all of you guys have spoken before. <laughs> uh, yes. It's rarer. It's rarer. So remember when I was talking about these GGGGG occurring all the time? 
if something occurs all the time, then finding that is not a big deal. It's like saying, all right, we're gonna find the suspect. Did he have a nose? Yes, he had a nose. But everybody has a nose, it's not helpful, right? If everybody has an, uh, an L and an M and an I, that's not very helpful. It gives me very little reward for finding that. But if he had, I don't know, a giant mustache, kind of like a W, <laughs> then that's a big deal, I'm excited. I'm gonna give it a, a reward of 11. So the rarer something is, the more information I have for matching it, okay? So that's just a diagonal. If something's very common, big deal, he had a nose. But if he had a mustache under the nose, that is actually a big deal, okay? So that's the diagonal. What about off-diagonal entries? So if I replace a leucine with a <clears throat> creatively named isoleucine, it's kind of like a leucine. Iso means the same in Greek. Um, so an isoleucine and a leucine, I don't even have a penalty for matching those. I actually have a reward for matching them, right? That's because, yeah, evolution couldn't care less. They both have very similar functions. They're replaced very frequently, okay? So one way to build this matrix is to hire a bunch of experts, put them in the room uh, for a bunch of days, and then they, they come up with, oh, these are the amino acids that are similar. That's one approach. The other approach is to just look at data. Basically, align a bunch of regions from a bunch of species and then see what in practice gets replaced right so if in practice i see that l and i are replacing each other very often then i'll give them a good reward okay so that's the principles number one rare things matter most because they provide more information if you look at information theory the surprise level that i get from an event is directly proportional to the information content. If, if somebody uh, says, hey, I slept yesterday, you know, I'm like, yeah, everybody sleeps. But if they tell me, ooh, I saw a rocket, you know, I don't see a rocket every day. So that's high information content, okay? So if somebody says, hey, how was your day? I'm gonna give the high information content event. It's stuff that doesn't happen all the time. I'm not gonna say, oh, I ate. Yes, we always eat, okay? So, but if I had an awesome meal at a restaurant, that's a big deal. So that's the first thing. The rarity is directly proportional to information content. The second one is what is actually similar properties, but the way to get at similar properties is either through a panel of experts working in a dark room for many days, or by massively gathering a bunch of data and seeing what actually gets replaced. So now let's look at quantitatively, what number do I actually put in each of these entries? So what I would like to put in each of these entries should be a probability, or more like a log probability to make addition rather than multiplication the norm, okay? So before we were adding all these scores. If these scores are negative log probabilities, then that sum is actually the product of probabilities, which is exactly the probability that the two are actually evolutionarily related. So it's kind of cool. We're now gonna realize that what we've been doing all along is in fact having a direct probabilistic interpretation of you know, the likelihood ratio of being related versus unrelated. So let's build that up. Let's talk about the probability that two similar sequences are in fact homologous, i.e. have an evolutionary common ancestry. And that's gonna be the likelihood ratio between two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, is that the alignment is simply due to chance, that their two sequences are unrelated. Hypothesis number two is that the two sequences are due to a common ancestry. In fact, that they're related, okay? And now we're gonna calculate the ratio of these two hypotheses. Basically, the probability of X and Y being aligned the way that they're aligned given the related versus the probability that X and Y are aligned exactly where they're aligned, given some random model, some unrelated model. So we're gonna calculate the probability of observing an alignment according to each of the hypotheses. P of X, Y given unrelated is gonna be, you know, the probability that, you know, A aligns on top of A and G aligns on top of G. And if A and G are very common, that unrelated alignment is also gonna be very probable. And then the other one is the related alignment. 
if they're truly evolutionary related, then how often do I find them on each other? And that's really where evolution comes in and says, yes, this amino acid has similar properties to that one. So instead of hiring a bunch of experts, I'm just going to hire evolution and then pay the big price of course, I don't know, for not, I don't know, uh, extinguishing me. Um, extinguishing me. Um, all right, so the alignment score is going to be the likelihood ratio between the two hypotheses and the probability that the alignment is not due to chance is going to be exactly that likelihood ratio. And the score is going to be the log of that probability. And the aha moment that everybody should be like raving about is that additive matrices are exactly that. So if I, in every pair in that big matrix, have the log probability of that ratio, then computing the score using my dynamic programming algorithm gives me exactly the probability of related divided by the probability of unrelated, as long as I have that likelihood ratio or the log of that at every entry. Okay? Let's work out the math. So what's the model for unrelated sequences? The probability of X and Y aligning on top of each other given unrelated is simply What's the chance of seeing an A here and the chance of also seeing an A there? That's just simply the frequency with which I see A, randomly. So that's, you know, frequency of A, frequency of A, and the product of that is just the probability of seeing A on top of A just by chance. The more frequent A is, the more frequent this happens by chance. For the related, it's a little different. It's basically, if I truly have a related sequences, then how often in a group of related sequences did I see those on top of each other? Okay, so it's the pair of X, I, Y, I. Okay, and that's, you know, that probability there. So if I have the probability of X, Y, the entire alignment of two sequences given the related model, it's just the product of the individual letters being on top of each other by the related model. And that's how often did I find them aligned in a group of truly evolutionary related sequences. And the ratio uh, has a denominator, which is the unrelated. So that's the likelihood ratio between these two hypotheses. And that is simply the product of these independent probabilities of seeing each character at each position. Who's with me so far? Raise your hands. Awesome. Great. So if we take the log, we basically have the log of this ratio being the sum of the logs of this ratio. And this is exactly the number I want to put in each of those entries in my matrix. So then the sum of all of these scores is nothing more than that. And the substitution matrix for that pair should be exactly that log probability. Okay. So there's two ways to do that. So Hennikoff and Hennikoff, husband and wife, basically did that in 1992. Um, and they created these block sum matrices. And then Dayhoff and Al did this in 78 by simulating forward evolution of a bunch of sequences. And that's how they obtained the PAM matrices. So Blossom was basically hand aligning or somewhat aligning a bunch of known, rela knowingly related sequences. And then PAM was just evolving forward from some ancestral sequences. And both tried to capture the relative substitutability of amino acid pairs in the context of evolution. Everybody with me? Great. And that's how we end up with these numbers. A positive number basically tells me that this is more likely to be related than unrelated. And a negative number tells me that this is much more likely to be unrelated than related. That this pair happens more by chance than by true evolution. And then the rare amino acids have higher weight. And then the common amino acids have lower weight. And then, you know, just in practice, chemically similar substitutions will basically have a uh, positive score because evolution tends to put them on top of each other. Yeah. Why uh, are I don't remember. I believe this is, uh, I have no idea what amino acid this is, Carrot. And basically, if I have no idea what it is, then it just simply uh, has to do with the frequency of the other amino acid. Great question. Yeah, any other? Okay. So then the substitution matrix for this is that, and we get these values by, uh, you know, uh, uh, how long ago these sequences were related. So basically the Blossom 62 matrix, which is uh, this matrix here, is basically for amino acid uh, pairs that are on average 62% similar. And for things that are further in evolution, I get a different matrix. For PAM matrices, it's super easy. I just keep running the evolution, the simulation forward a little longer. 
and then I get PAM, you know, 30, PAM 25, PAM 20, and so on and so forth, further and further evolution. For Blossom, I just need to find sequences that are further and further in evolution that are still known to be related, okay? And then that gives me, for that evolutionary distance, what is the expected frequency of different amino acids. And in an ideal world, these would just be products of each other to basically get to further and further sequences. And I can get the delta by sort of making that sort of very small. In practice, there's some deviations and some substitutions that happen only at very large evolutionary distances. Okay? So that's where Blossom came from. Basically, these trusted alignments of related sequences provide information about biological permissibly, biologically permissible uh, mutations. And that's sort of where uh, these matrices came from. Okay? So uh, Hennigoff and Hennigoff, but basically, just basically went and counted how frequently these were occurring in different locations and then built those matrices. And that's how these come from. Okay? And that answers your question, I hope, of, you know, in that neighborhood list, why did I get 15 instead of 18? That's just reading these pairs and adding up the score. Who feels that they've learned something today? Awesome. Who feels that they got everything so far? Remember that nice feeling. You may want to just shed, close your eyes now, just like run away from the room, because the next four minutes is going to be something like super crazy. Okay? Who wants something super crazy? Yay. Awesome. So now let's do deterministic linear time alignment, okay? And remember this great feeling because you might lose it soon. So the exact uh, matching problem basically says I have a string, which is a pattern, and a longer string, which is called the text, and I want to find all occurrences, if any, of pattern P in text T. I basically can scan and just find all of the matches, okay? And there's three matches here. Great. Everyone can do this. How did I do it? By basically comparing uh, n squared algorithm, n times m. At every position, I match that pattern. Okay? But here's the deal. If I um, carry out these matches with a naive algorithm, I basically do n times m computations. In the worst case, I test every position. So if I'm comparing the string AAAA with AAAA, at every position, I will have match, 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 and then shift by one, match, 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 shift by one, match, 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 match. So the question is, can we do better? How can I exploit the solution here by realizing that in the first time that I, ma that I put it there, I had A, 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 A. The next time that I put it there, do I need to do all four comparisons? I see some heads shaking now. So if I have AAA with AAA, then all I need to do, <laughs> yes, I said it the right number of times. <laughs> um, all I need to do is basically realize that, hey, there's some self-similarity of that matter, of that pattern. And if the pattern is self-similar, I can do bigger jumps because I've matched the first four. And therefore, the next time I shift by one, I only need to match the next character. So if I compare this to that, I can do it in linear time, right? Because every single time I'll be like, ooh, all of that matched. Shift by one, check only that position. That matched again. Shift by one, check only one position. So in the end, I only check this one position at a time, and it becomes a linear time algorithm. Who's with me on that? Raise your hands. Awesome. Now, what about the exact opposite situation? So at one end, I can do linear time. What about at the other end? If I have BBBB and nothing matches, do I need to check each character again? No. I know that none of them match, so I just need to check the next character over. Again, all the way through. Who's with me on this one? Awesome. So on one side, I can do order n. On the other side, I can do order n. What about in the middle? Can you extrapolate? <laughs> yes. So um, here's the deal. The key insight is that we're going to be making bigger shifts. When these things match and don't match, we're going to gather information from every comparison. And I'm going to use these comparisons to learn the internal redundancy structure of my pattern. Okay? How can I do that? By basically learning something about the pattern each time. And the way to do that is learning this fundamental redundancy structure, which will basically tell me no matter 
what string I'm given, at every position, I will write the length of self-similarity that I have starting at that position and starting at the beginning, okay? So here, the length of self-similarity is one because I only have A matching with A. But over here, it's three because I have AAB matching AAB. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. So I can compute the length of self-similarity at every starting position, right? Yeah, that's a pre-processing step. But then it turns out that it will be the actual processing step because I can do this pre-processing in linear time. And that's where your brain should be going, oh my God, this is amazing. So as I compute the self-similarity, I can reuse the result of self-similarity to compute the self-similarity, okay? And therefore I can compute that in linear time by having a left and a right pointer. And as I go through adjusting them to compute all this, you can read through the, read through the slides at home, it's a, it's a lot of fun. But the beauty of it is that if I have already computed the self-similarity here and I want to compute it there, I can use the fact that I have already computed it here to basically recursively reuse the result and recompute that self-similarity, okay? So I can compute K as a function of K prime because of that redundancy that, that is being made explicit, okay? And depending on whether that window is smaller or, or bigger than, than the boundary that I've already computed, I can basically adjust and in both cases it works out, okay? Uh, and, and now are you ready for your mind to be completely blown? Um, if I can compute that in linear time, then to basically match a string, to match a pattern in any character, all I need to, to do is compute the self-similarity of that concatenated string, which I can now do in linear time, and by putting a character here in the middle, I've solved my problem because I know that this character will never occur in my string. And therefore, in this vector, whatever matches the length of P are going to be all the locations that match exactly in linear time. Okay? Who thinks this was awesome? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, a few people. Who remembers that awesome feeling that you had when you understood everything in lecture? Okay, again, I, I'll be throwing some of these things, you know, to you just because, you know, it's kind of fun. Uh, but what did we learn about today? We learned about global alignment and local alignment. We learned about linear time exact string matching. We learned about inexact matching with hashing. And how all of these crazy stuff that we were doing on Tuesday just by a recipe turns out to have been a probabilistic interpretation of the log probability of a likelihood ratio of unrelated to related or the other way around which basically gives us exactly the probability of relatedness for any pair of sequences. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Yay. Okay, see you guys on Tuesday.